Chris White from White Labs joins me this week to talk about producing commercial beer yeast. This is Beersmith Podcast number 210. This is Beersmith Podcast number 210, and it's mid-March 2020. Chris White joins me to discuss commercial beer yeast production. Thank you to this week's sponsors, Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Every issue of Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine is packed with articles for homebrewers and beer lovers. They're currently offering 20% off their all-access subscription pass, with access to videos, brewing courses, exclusive articles, and the Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Go to beerandbrewing.com slash beersmith to get your all-access pass today. Again, that's beerandbrewing.com slash beersmith. And also the Brew Easy. Brew big and small spaces with the best all-grain ultra-compact system available. The Brew Easy's revolutionary setup combines batch barge efficiency, brew-in-a-bag simplicity, and the work clarification of a rim system. It's easy to set up, easy to operate, and easy on the eyes. Add the optional brew commander for precise temperature control and mash automation. With the Brew Easy, you'll discover definitive proof that size isn't everything. Electric and propane models are available. It's also the system that I brew on. Visit BlickmanEngineering.com for more information. Again, that's BlickmanEngineering.com. And finally, I urge you to give Beersmith 3 Brewing Software a try. Beersmith 3 adds mead, wine, and cider recipe support to the Beersmith beer platform, along with new integrated water profile and mash pH tools. Dozens of new features, including cloud folders, updated databases, support for fruit, juice, and honey, as well as new Whirlpool hop options. Download your free 21-day trial today from beersmith.com and give it a try. And now let's jump into this week's episode. Today on the show, I welcome back Dr. Chris White. Chris is the president of White Labs, Inc. and a top provider of brewing yeast worldwide, as well as a 2015 winner of the AHA Governing Committee Award uh, for a lifetime of achievement in brewing. He's also the author of the book Yeast, which is the Bible for brewing yeast. Chris, it's uh, fantastic to have you back on the show. Hi, Brad. It's great to be back. Um, thanks for having me on. So you're in uh, San Diego today, I think, right? Yep, I'm in San Diego, and um, uh, not a lot of travel on my schedule right now, so uh, yeah, happy to be you're, on the show. You're usually living off of an airplane in a suitcase somewhere, I think, right? Yeah, and then I don't usually kind of over the holidays, you know, December, January, so that was going to turn into a big travel schedule <laughs> for me, and um, which is not going to happen, which is fine. It's nice to be at home. Yeah. Um, in some ways, you know, that, that part's great being home and, uh, with family and then, uh, be able to, uh, help, uh, around white labs. Well, I appreciate you coming on a uh, fairly short notice. I had a whole bunch of cancellations, uh, because of all the things going on in the world right now. Um, how have you been managing, uh, uh with your production and operations there? Well, it's something that kind of consumes all day, every day right now, uh, planning for this, working with our staff, working with our production, our customers, um, and uh, our staff has been great. Uh, we've, our mission has been keeping everybody employed. Uh, everybody's working less hours. Uh, we are making yeast. We're delivering yeast. We're doing all of our lab work on a really, you know, reduced level, clean, sanitary, a lot of things to make employees safe. That's the number one priority. Um, most of the office folks and support, you know, staff are working from home. Um, and everybody is pitching in. Um, everybody also wants to, you know, keep working as much as possible um, and, and understands the situation. Uh, we're all in it together. Awesome. I, yeah, I think, uh, you know, things are picking up maybe a little bit in homebrewing. I think some people uh, being stuck at home are turning to homebrewing, but I would imagine uh, commercial sales are probably down a bit. Yeah, commercial sales are down a lot. Um, yeah. So, you know, that's where most of our yeast is sold. Uh, and breweries are slowing down, shutting down. Uh, they're doing some to-go sales. They're doing some crowler sales. Uh, our, we, we started selling beer from our brewery uh in california and we're doing that in around Asheville as well in delivery um but 
that that stone's going to mount to a little bit, right? People are just trying to keep their businesses open a little bit, keep their staff um, with jobs. And yeah. so I think if everybody can support the craft breweries and, and restaurants as much as possible um, through those programs, I think that's really helpful. Yeah, I was seeing a lot of curbside delivery, I think, uh, from a lot of the smaller breweries. And then um, also, uh, at least, you know, like my local homebrew shop, they have curbside delivery and pickup now, too. You can place an order online and, uh, you know, go and pick it up right outside the shop, which is great. That's great. And in California, they also, uh, the ABC, the California ABC, um, relaxed some of the restrictions even on restaurants. Uh, so they can sell to-go beer and cocktails and wine. And, you know, that helps a little bit with to matching the food they're trying to do, some of the restaurants. But, you know, I live downtown San Diego and it's just a ghost town. Uh, most of the restaurants have done the numbers and it's just better for them to close right now than to to try to stay open, uh, which is a more expensive option. But the ones that are doing it, it's really nice to help them out because they're not doing it for profit. They're doing it to yeah. keep some of the staff. Yeah, I know some of them have gift card options too, where you can buy a gift card and support the operation, you know, uh, temporarily. So, um, yeah. Well, today you're right. Home brewing. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. You said home brewing. uh, We have seen it go up. Uh, It's it started last week. Uh, This week was stronger, um, and the homebrew stores um, they are getting a lot of interest. There's new home brewers uh, coming into the stores or through online, and then we haven't seen that in a decade. So that's nice. Yeah, I think we talk, uh, home brewing has been in decline since, uh, I don't know, like 2013, I think. So it's quite a long time, really. Uh, yeah. So it is nice to see, uh, I guess, uh, you know, things pick up a little bit here. And I mentioned, uh, I think mostly large online stores are still shipping. And uh, also, many of the local stores are offering curbside pickup options, too. So, Right. Um, but today I want to discuss how you actually grow and create uh, yeast. Uh, so let's start at the beginning and, uh, talk about your yeast bank. What's a yeast bank, first of all? Well, that's a real critical part of a, of a yeast lab. Uh, it's, it's, uh, the, like the entire collection of our yeast strains frozen at minus 80 degrees Celsius. Um, and we have a yeast culture team that only works with the freezes. They're only ones allowed in the freezer. Uh, and we maintain those strains with that group. We are, they're the ones that take the strains out to create working plates. Um, they're the ones that, you know, um, and then make, get the culture to a point where it's available for production. So they're working with the freezes to get them into production. And they're also working with new strains that are coming in to get them into freezes. That's pretty awesome. So, um, so what, I mean, how many, how many yeast roughly do you have in, in your yeast bank today? There's, uh, around a thousand strains, uh, wow. in our, in our freezes. Um, and we make about a hundred a week of 70 core strains, a bunch of vault strains, a bunch of private strains, um, and a few other things we do. So, uh, that all has to be scheduled in to production runs between Asheville, San Diego, and Copenhagen. San Diego having the largest production. Copenhagen, uh, Asheville's pretty close now uh, to San Diego in production levels, and Copenhagen smaller. So the production team, the planning team that's based in San Diego, uh, coordinates how that yeast culture team works with the freezes to get the strains ready to get the production slots filled uh, because you only have so many reactors uh, to make all those strains uh, based on the orders we have and what we need to make. That's pretty awesome. And um, are are they stored in slants? Is that, is that the correct term or how does that work? And you mentioned stored freezing at what? Minus 80 degrees Celsius. Yeah. Yeah, That's the, that's the way you cryogenically, you know, or liquid nitrogen is really cryogenic, but uh, that's how you store them forever you know that's that's where they don't change even on uh petri dishes and and slants so kind of plates and slants uh those um the colonies grow on some media but they will mutate over a few months because they're still slowly growing even at refrigerator temperatures Hmm. uh so 
what we you can you can the deep freezes are the the permanent bank and then you have things you're working from there then people usually go to petri dishes and then sometimes slants the difference with petri dishes plates and slants yeah are that the slants have a little longer shelf life for the yeast because that's screw cap doesn't have air like can get into a, a petri dish will dry out a little bit mm. um and so a lot of the biotech world a lot of even large breweries will work on slants because of that shelf life issue but we don't keep our cultures on media for very long so we don't really use slats we might sell yeast to some larger breweries on slats but we go from our freezes to what we call working plates where we make sure we've got uniform colonies and, and the correct culture. And then we create, um, well, sorry, we call that freeze plate. Then we go to working plates. And from those working plates, we take the colonies from those to begin our culturing. So slants are not really part of our production. They're not needed in our production because okay. we, we don't want to hold those for more than 30 days. Right. Right. Um, how do you, uh, make sure that you have a pure yeast sample? I guess I assume the ones that you have deep frozen are hundred percent pure somehow, but how do you, how do you make sure you only have one, one strain of yeast to start with? Yeah. You do a lot of work before you make the freeze to make sure you make a freeze of a single culture. And then when you take it out of the freezes, just as another backup, another QC standards, uh, those freeze plates, we uh, will look, again, for uniform colonies. We will do uh, mini fermentations. This is before anything gets back to a working plate. So the mini fermentations, we're looking for the right attenuation, the right flocculation, the right flavor compounds. Uh, we will uh, PCR uh, to confirm uh, what we're looking for from that culture. So, I mean, you're doing a lot of testing all the way along as you're building up this uh, uh, sample into something usable, right? Correct. And that's really why this is a lab scale propagation and a lab scale company. Mm -hmm. We, there are, you know, in the industry and things that uh, I would call propagation or, you know, in breweries themselves, they'll do a propagation, but they're not necessarily maintaining the yeast bank uh the way we've invested in and that's why even large companies large breweries and things and distilleries and such that have their own culture will use us to store or even as a backup for their own systems uh that strain in our yeast bank hmm. as a private strain so you uh uh you got it to up to a, let's say a petri dish or something like that in the in the lab. How do you then build that up to something you can actually create production volumes from? So then our yeah, so our our production planners will say okay, because we we start yeast from those petri dishes seven days a week, every day except right now, um, <laughs> in a reduced schedule. But uh, so. So there's there's yeast to start from those petri dishes every day. That comes from the production planners. It has a, it's going to be available for sale in about 17 days from that, which includes the propagation time and the testing time. Right? Mm -hmm. it, it takes it, it, if you can't just make yeast in a few days, you can. But where's the testing? Right. right. So the testing is part of our 17 day process. So they'll have um, the folks in the microbiology lab will have their starts. So they'll take from the Petri dishes, which are a lot numbered and everything part of the whole. So they, they're told their list of what says start has the lot numbers and things on the plates. Um, so they'll pull those, they'll inoculate those into small uh, volumes of sterile wort that's been autoclaved. It's mm -hmm. brewer's wort made in our brewery, but then sterilized in autoclave on the so, lab scale. Oh, so uh, they, you, the autoclave, I guess, uh, uh, gives you, it sterilizes it, right? Yeah. Right, because everything we're doing in, in brewing is boiling, and some of the industries don't even boil, uh, but brewing does. And so that gives you a very clean starting material when you make your beer. 
but it's not sterile. Right. Um, you know, that's, that's a hundred degrees C, you know, boiling, but the sterilizing is 125, 250 Fahrenheit. So you have to do that in a pressure vessel of some kind, right? Correct. So for the larger volumes, so the lab scale volumes are pulled and then autoclave. The production volumes, once these sizes get into the larger reactors, come from a uh, pressurized large volume oil. So I'm so I'm imagining you're making you know something akin to a sterile starter, right? Yeah, and homebrewers can do that with a pressure cooker. You know, those aren't very expensive. Uh, you can sterilize hundred mil or maybe even liter bottles, depending on what size your pressure cooker, and uh, with a loose cap that's then push, uh, close completely once you take them out. But you got to have a loose cap so the steam gets everywhere mm-hmm. and the pressure can equalate uh, equilibrate everywhere. Uh, Because it's that pressure that raises the temperature in the pressure cooker that gives you the sterilization, basically killing all the spores, killing all the other things that might not survive, may survive a boil. Now, in general, I don't don't need to do that. Right. But we could do it. Right. Yeah. And and most breweries, as I said, that propagate yeast, perhaps say they grow it up in love, they'll use wort from the brew house. They won't sterilize it either. But it's important on the small scale, even though we do on the large scale. Uh, just to ensure the right conditions and the right yeast. On the lab scale, if you're not sterilizing, you're not doing it right. So if a home brewer, for example, wanted to start yeast from a petri dish, they need a pressure cooker or an autoclave. Otherwise, you're going to have a non-pure yeast sample at the end. Okay, so you step this thing up to, uh, I assume, at least a few, some number of liters, right? And then you're going to actually now bring it over to the production equipment, right? What is a, what does a production equipment actually look like? Yeah, so after the time in the lab, so you can start at 5 mils or 10 mils. Uh, you wouldn't really want to do much more than that. Some people go right from a Petri dish to 50 mils. That's too much. Okay. So say uh, it's, it's 10 mils. You go... Uh, increments of 10 up every two days. So 10 mils, 100 mils, one liter, 10 liters, 100 liters. And see, I've done two days every step there. One day is not enough. It's not as good yeast. Uh, so again, people sometimes compress that. But you need to give the yeast the time to develop the right physiology. Uh, so they're going to have a strong fermentation. And so, so 10, 10x volume, how, how many yeast cells? Are we doubling the yeast every time? Are we... I think it's like five times, six times, right? Right. Yeah. It's like five Five or six times, times, I think, right? Per cycle, roughly? Correct. Yeah. Correct. And so then you you go up to those 10 times. And so say now you're in 100 liters, one hectoliter, close to one barrel uh, size. Um, You know, from there, you're going in, you know, now you're even at 100 liters, you're out of lab scale. Yeah. So we would call that production scale so we go our lab the microbiology lab there's a few labs here but there's a microbiology lab that's connected to the production room they're Mm -hmm. both lab clean rooms um but you know once it leaves the lab scale it goes to the production scale where the production team takes it and puts it into uh, our reactors and then it'll go from that reactor to one more step higher in volume and then when it after that process, then they'll cool it down and get to the point of getting the yeast in the stationary phase and getting the yeast so we can collect. So you can actually collect it, yeah. So what does yeah. a reactor look like? Is that, uh, you know, is it look anything like my home brewing equipment or, or a typical brewing equipment, or is it something different? It can, and it used to for us. Uh, I... Uh, you know, we we created our own process. There wasn't a textbook or a course or a, any kind of examples, really. That uh, so so I took my experience from different kinds of yeast to brewer's yeast because of the home brewing hobby, and I wanted a lot of brewer's yeast for my hobby. Uh, so I I first started with things like um, stainless steel, uh, polypropylene, which is an autoclavable type of plastic, uh, pharmaceutical grade. Right. Um, plastic. And, uh, you, and you, I would use things like that to scale the yeast up, grow it, collect it, and package it. Um, but we now, you know, 
we have our own process, the patented uh, flex cell process that makes the pure pitch that doesn't have any stainless steel. Right. And I, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute, I think, yeah. but, um, I was, so I assume as you're stepping it up, though, you're using a small, uh, are, are you still using pure pitch all the way now or, or how does that work? I don't, I don't know. Yeah. So the, the basically, you know, all, so the pharmaceutical industry, which we compare ourselves to a lot, even though we're making food grade products, we're FDA inspected and, you know, the person who will come from a local biotech company in San Diego, the FDA inspector, sure, they know that's pharma grade. Now they'll come over to White Labs, and they'll, uh, they know they're now in a food-grade facility. But we built it like a uh, pharmaceutical grade because oh, wow. yeast for brewers has an intense requirement for purity. Right. Uh, way more than baker's yeast was ever made to or wine yeast or things. So even though beer is sold at sort of a low price, um, it's one of the highest purity needs from a microbiology perspective, because all those little bits of wild yeast, other other yeast, uh, bacteria uh, create really noticeable off flavors in beer. Yeah, they do absolutely. Um, so, as I understand it, when you're doing this, you're basically fermenting. Kind of, is it a lower, lower gravity wort uh, in order to make uh, you know continue to grow the yeast all the way up? Yeah. So traditionally in the brewing industry, uh, twelve Plato is is a kind of standard propagation. Or we do something a little different than that, a little proprietary. But um, but I mean, twelve Plato is pretty, you know, pretty pretty low. That's uh, what ten ten oh four, I think. Yeah, ten forty. Right? Yeah, yeah. So and the the thing that is interesting, right? If you grow yeast, uh, say ten forty, yeah, versus ten sixty, you would think if you grow the yeast at ten sixty, more sugar, more yeast. It's the opposite. If you grow yeast at 1040 versus 1060, you get a higher yield at 1040. Interesting. And why is that? Because yeast are incorporating the sugar in a defined way, starting with glucose and getting it's working through different sugars until they get to maltose. And the more sugar you put on yeast, just the more other stuff they do with it. You know, they... They'll send it to amino acid the synthesis. The, you know, it's just it's just loading the, it's just eating everything it can, like we do if we have a big plate of food and you don't want to take home any leftovers. You know, so so that extra sugar doesn't go through the system slow enough to really create new yeast cells. So if you overload the yeast with sugar, the crabtree effect is kind of what we're talking about, but the crabtree effect is still in effect at 12 Plato. Right. But if you um it, you know you, you there's, at least you find a nice little media, uh, something in the middle where uh, you're still getting the biomass you want, but you know you're not overloading the cells with carbohydrates. Yeah, I think Palmer did an episode where he talked about how many sheep you can put on an acre, that kind of a thing. Oh, okay. Kind of, kind of the same idea, maybe. I haven't heard that uh, line <laughs> from him. That, that, yeah. Well, yeah, John, you know, sure. yeah, he's got his own style. Too many, too many sheep on the on one acre, and you and you got problems, right? That's great. Yeah. <laughs> um, how do you harvest and concentrate the yeast for packaging? How do you uh, go about doing that? So traditionally in, uh, in stainless steel, which, you know, is, is what most people would you have used traditionally, uh, even the pharmaceutical industry, that's what they used to use too, of course. Um, you harvest, you know, you have a conical uh bottom vessel um and you now in brewing just to take a step back if, if this is for a brewery and they have a propagator they might not necessarily have a conical bottom because they're going to tend send 10 percent of that volume over into the fermenters okay now somebody making yeast like us or really wanting to collect yeast you'd usually have a conical bottom and you'd, you'd harvest the yeast kind of like a brewery does. So kind of just open out. up open up the valve at the bottom of the cone, huh? Right. But that's not what we do. No. Uh, because, you know, you are, once you open the valve at the bottom of the tank, uh, you, ha, collecting that in the cleanest, closest to sterile manner, how do you do that? How do you not you get oxygen ingress? 
uh, yep. what you do. Yep. You know, an oxygen damages yeast. Not like the same way it does in beer and giving uh, off flavors, like skunkiness, right? Yeah. But oxygen damages yeast cells just like it damages our own cells through oxidation and, and mutation. Makes sense. So, uh, and not just that. Um, well, sorry. <laughs> I was thinking, of, of course, I was saying light struck for beer. But oxygen damages beer because it stales the beer. Oxygen damages yeast uh, through the oxidation I mentioned, and also it want it makes yeast want to grow. Yeah, we're, oxygen, we're talking about sterols, right? Pardon? They, they create sterols, I think, right? Uh, glycogen. Yeah. So, well, oxygen is used to make the sterols. Correct. Correct. Yeah. In the in the in the process, and that's why we feed our yeast oxygen during. All of these propagation processes, and you do recommend reason. you do. I know we had this discussion before, but you do recommend using yeah. oxygen whether you're making beer, wine, mead, whatever, right? Well, yeah, for propagation, it's important. But yeah. just remember, if you're adding oxygen, you're allowing other things to grow that don't grow in normal non-oxygenated beer environments. Another reason to have sterile starting materials. Yeah, I, I, I'm uh, talking about. I'm talking about obviously before fermentation, right? Aeration, we call it, I guess. Oh, yeah. Well, yeast are not anaerobic. You know, they can't live without oxygen. Right. So we have to give them some oxygen. And we've just done a boil that's driven out most of the oxygen. Yep. And that transfer can add a one or two ppm of oxygen, but you need 10. So brewers actively add oxygen, and you have to, to have the best fermentation. You'll have fermentation without doing that because yeast survive by what we're talking uh, about like a lot of winemakers say we don't need any oxygen and of course they do get some from the grapes but you know and they don't uh, boil that's true absolutely true too yeah yeah they're yeah. not driving that oxygen out but um but when i started you know 25 years ago whatever in this industry and i started going to wine shows we started supplying the wine yeast and i would talk to winemakers yeah and they'd say i need oxygen are you crazy we don't add oxygen uh in the beginning of fermentation but now a lot do yeah. What they were having before was stuck fermentations. And that was just part of the wine industry. You started fermentations at harvest, you know, around September, October, and you restarted stuck fermentations with new yeast in January. <laughs> now that more wineries are adding oxygen at the time they pitched the yeast, they're having less stuck fermentations because the yeast grows with that oxygen to the right number and you don't have stuck fermentations. Brewers don't have any stuck fermentations because we've been adding oxygen as an industrial practice for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, back to packaging. So you, you mentioned uh, you don't obviously use a conical fermenter with a concentrator and everything. How do you, how do, you do it? Uh, well, packaging yeast is always I mean, something that's fascinated me. Like, how do you, how do you collect it? And you I mean, how do you do, uh, here's another question. How do, you, how do you separate the yeast from all the other stuff that, that, that might be in there? Bits of grain and you, so on. Yeah. How do, yeah. How do you separate it? How do you collect 70 different strains uh, from a you know production environment excuse me how do you um, how do you not add oxygen <laughs> how do you own all this stuff so as we were growing I kept working more and more on our yeast collection or packaging and then if you collect it into something that's not a package yeah which is what currently most people would do, right? You've got to then take it from that collection, just call it a brink, call it a 20 liter carboy or something. And then you have to put it into something you're going to sell the yeast in. So that's a of second course. process. And then you've got to also, you know, so it's not when, when you collect the yeast from a, a stainless steel tank, it's not into a package. You can't sell it yet. It's going to take more time. And then what some people do is, um, you know, then say, well, okay, now that's, that's my package date. But it could be in that bottle for a while. Right. That makes sense. So, so we, we wanted to create uh, a method where the yeast from the reactor is in a package, QC, and ready to sell, with no oxygen pickup and no possibility for introducing contaminants and so since uh again i try to stay tight to the pharmaceutical industry and different trade shows and people and whatever but i noticed that they were starting to grow yeast and film you right. call it bag 
but I don't like that word because uh, it doesn't really represent what it is. And the pharmaceutical industry wouldn't use that word. Uh, so it's film, uh, but very specialized film that is verified sterile, not CIP stainless steel, which is, you know, think about a human injectable. It gives them a better protection uh, and verifiable. Uh, FDA likes it. And then they, so the pharmaceutical industry switched to growing yeast and film. Uh, quite a while ago, and so Genentech and these other companies, uh, every plant's a little different, but use a lot of film. And so I, I kind of thought uh, my my moment of of like whoa uh, was just thinking uh, if we grew yeast in film, we could seal it in the film. See, because we want the yeast. Those pharmaceutical companies I mentioned aren't really concerned about that because they want the stuff that comes out of the yeast or bacteria, the drug they're making. We want the yeast. So if we could grow it in film, we could seal it in the film, sealers. Right. And there's your package. There's your no oxygen pickup because you're not transferring anything. There's your no introduction of potential contaminants from the environment. And uh, so that led us down the path to create Pure Pitch. And that is, of course, your Pure Pitch packaging, which you have in, you know, anything from a little tiny package. In fact, I got a couple in the fridge here. Uh, up to much larger ones or multiple liters, right? Yeah, all the yeast is sold like that. Uh, we do some custom pours for breweries that want a cap. We do uh, some uh, blends and some like a vault strains in vials still um, for certain different reasons. Um, but we grow it all the same. Mm -hmm. And it's sealed into the pure pitch packages at the time we collect it. Then we can do some custom pours or or, um, or vials, but we're working on uh, upgrades to Pure Pitch, and we had a lot of momentum going on this for the last year before this current situation is going on with COVID nineteen. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, we're still working on. We're working on some innovations, uh, which was always the intention of Pure Pitch, but real active innovations now that's going to make Pure Pitch easier to use. Everything's going to be able to be in Pure Pitch. And uh, it's, it's, it's listening to our customers, home brewers, commercial breweries, so on, that say, I want this, I want this, I want this. We've got this big list. We've got our own list of what on the manufacturing side would be better uh, and, and more efficient and so on, better for the staff. Hmm. And that's all wrapping into these upgrades that are coming out later this year. Now, uh, stepping back for a minute, separation. Do you actually have to worry about separating the yeast from other trube or whatever that's coming out? Because I know, you know, I get a lot of grain bits and stuff when I certainly make my work. Yeah. So um, we can either make uh, yeast. So the wort is all grain, right? So right. I would assume you, I would assume you make it very much like I do, right? Right. Except you, you probably don't use, use any hops, right? Uh, we use a little bit, a little bit. Uh, okay. We're really trying to make, uh, but we're it's a liquid uh, uh, hops. But we're trying to make a very uh, when we're making brewer's yeast different than wine yeast and different than some other things, substrates. We're we're really trying to make a very. We didn't used to, but we've trials and trials and trials showed us that the closer this is to beer wort, the better the yeast is going to behave in beer wort. And so. Um, Ready, it's going to be ready just to attack that, you know, right from a physiological standpoint as well. That's really cool. And there's interactions between yeast and hops. Yeah. So we can either start with an extract like a powder or a syrup that's, um, and, and sterilize that in a pressure cooker. So there's, there's where you don't have a lot of, uh, grain bits and things. You'd have some trube, or you can do it in a brew house with all grain starting materials with a really good whirlpool. So we have a mixture of both. Uh, we have a four-vessel brew house uh, that produces sterile wort because it's the kettle and the whirlpool are pressure vessels um, that we can get up to that uh, 250 degrees Fahrenheit. Makes sense. So you just do a really hot whirlpool, huh? Yeah, under pressure. Under pressure, of course. <laughs> yeah, So and both tanks have to be under pressure, and there's some engineering to get a liquid moved under pressure like that yeah um but and then we use that in san diego we use that same four vessel brew house with a specialized kettle and whirlpool to make beer on to sell as white labs brewing company in our two tap rooms 
And then we turn off those that system. Mm -hmm. So, because in, in a traditional beer, you want to volatize things; otherwise, you're going to have some buff flavors, sulfur, and things. So, sure. So we um, we turn those off and make smaller batches of beer. Wow, in those that's really cool. So, does that uh, separate most of the debris out? I guess so when you do that process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and we. We want a little bit of true, but it's part of the ingredient process that type of what we're trying to make. Uh, true has some uh, fatty acid material uh, that is uh, rather than adding fatty acid material back in for good yeast growth. We take advantage of already what's there in a mm -hmm. measured amount, you know, so uh, and distribute that among all the reactors for that day. Um, again, because every day there's every day there's the Petri dish is being worked on. The, the, the first step in the culture, the next step, the next step, the next step. Yeast started, yeast collected. And so every day there's a set of reactors uh, started. And um, that wart will be moved into those so the wart's all the same in each reactor. And Very so there's cool. a little bit of truth. That, that's a long answer for that question. But um, you won't see a big cap of true, for example, on top of our yeast. Makes sense, yeah. So, um, go over some of the advantages for the pure pitch technology then. Uh, we've already talked through quite a few of them, but uh, I thought maybe give you a chance to summarize here. Yeah, um, it, it, it prevents the uh, very minimal oxygen uptake, uh, which gives us our really long shelf lives. So, you know, if, you, if you take our six-month-old yeast or four- or five-month-old yeast and compare it to anything else, it's going to have a lot higher viability. Um, yeah, I think even at, even at six months, the numbers, uh, at least your lab sent me numbers a while ago, is like 68%, I think, or something like that, which is very high, really. Yeah. Most of them are well below 50% at that point for liquid yeast. So, Correct. And the film, uh, since we, uh, we blow the film, uh, we dial in exactly what the film should have property-wise. So uh, it releases uh, CO2 gas. So, you know, think about yeast in storage. It slowly makes some CO2. And in, our, uh, in the past with our vials, you'd open them up. Sometimes they have a lot of gas in them. That yep. shortens the shelf life. Um, and so the film will release that gas slowly. It's not just goes right out, but it has to develop a certain partial pressure. But that, that keeps the CO2 from building up in the culture. So less oxygen in the beginning, less CO2 buildup uh, are two of the big factors why the yeast has a longer shelf life and what makes pure pitch uh, so unique. And the fact that the yeast was collected in that, in that film and sealed so it, you're not introducing any kind of uh, contaminants from filling. The filling is always the part where a final product has a chance of obtaining a problem. I mean, think of breweries, think of any kind of food and beverage being packaged. That's your critical control point. And we were able to get rid of that and minimize that critical control point by harvesting these right in the film. And you also talked about how you, you know, you're literally taking sterilization, working with sterile wort all the way through the entire process too. Right. Sterile wort through the whole process. Um, and lots of, lots of checks. QC uh, samples, um, and and it's not released until that final QC, which is p already from the film. See, it's not like a think of a big can line. Oh, you take a couple of cans out and QC those. But breweries have had lots of troubles with. Well, every sixth can has a problem because of one of the filler heads, right? So you can put that same analogy to any packaging line. Uh, for us, the yeast is in the film, and before it's divided, a piece of that is taken off. So that is completely representative of all the yeast in the film. Very cool. Right. That's awesome. Um, can you talk for a minute about what the commercial packaging look like? I, I think everybody, uh, at least most people listening, are familiar with what your uh, your homebrew size packaging looks like. But uh, and what sizes are available for commercial use? They're bigger. Uh, you know, seriously, that's, uh, that's kind of the difference. Um, they're still in the, film though, right? They're still in film. Two liters is the most common size we sell. 
um, and increments of two liter. Other people buy ten liters. They'll buy five of them. You know, they'll buy fifty of them. They'll buy. Um, and so two liters is a very typical size for us for a commercial brewery. That'll pitch average of ten hectoliters, depending on the beer. Sometimes five. Uh, you know, depending on what pitch rate they want. Um, so two but, two liters, ten hectoliters, ten barrels ish. I don't know. Correct. Yeah, yeah, close enough. Yeah. East. Yeah. Um, you know, but but actually on the calculators we get to specific differences, but I'm sure, yeah. But that's that's awesome. Yeah, so it's a two liter pure pitch that it just looks like a much bigger homebrew pure pitch. It's got the same uh film. Uh it is from the same uh bulk vessel. So we call that bulk yeast. When we when we seal the yeast in the film, now we've got bulk yeast. We take a piece of that off for QC, and then we slice and dice it. It's already sealed, right? So there is no more input of anything. It's now just on heat sealers, making small homebrew packages, making two-liter packages, depending on what we need to fill the orders. And every day when those reactors are harvested, by the end of that day where that lot, after it clears QC, right, it's stored, cold, then it's, uh, then it's, what I'm trying to say is once that day's lot it goes to packaging where the heat sealers are, at the end of the day, it's all in a package. There's right. no yeast left behind to be packaged someday later nice. uh, for some kind of order that we might not have. We seal it. A lot of it's already uh, on order. We might be shipping out the next day or two or the next week or two. Awesome. Hey, can you talk, Chris, a little bit about the quality control? I know we mentioned it briefly when we were talking about the lab, but what kind of steps do you take all the way along to uh, make sure, you know, you're getting a pure product out the door? Uh, traceability, the, um, and that's, that's one thing the FDA looks for as well, uh, especially for export. But the traceability of our own raw ingredients tied to that lot number, the lot number moves through all the way from Petri dish to final product. Um, and we use little scanners, you know, uh, on the film, uh, where it's transferring from to the next vessel. So the operator is transferring that lot, uh, and it's flowing through our advanced manufacturing system is what they call it in, in NetSuite. Um, and so all of the testing that we do is also, t uh, feeds into that lot. So for example, when we have that bulk, uh, east in that sealed in that vessel, and a piece of that goes to the lab. Uh, we will take that and we will put on uh, the, the Petri dishes. Uh, we will look at a microscope. We will HLP, for example. So we'll look for wild yeast and bacteria. Um, and those have to be zero on our, our zero C CFUs uh, to clear the yeast. We get the pH. Uh, again, we get the cell count. And that's all printed on a QC sheet. So it's it's very transparent. The cell counts there. The date that it cleared QC is there. Not when we packaged it or whatever, but the date it cleared QC. Nice. Um, and all the results. And so you have that, you have that for every, every lot, right? Every lot. Yeah. Every lot. It's a live QC. So on the two liter packages, the label's big enough to print all of that information. So the pro brewer sees it right there. Nice. On the homebrew packages are smaller. So uh, it, you go to eastman.com and put in that lot number. You don't have to sign in to eastman.com. You can just put that lot number and it'll give you the full QC sheet. And oh, nice. I didn't, I didn't even know that. That's right. awesome. Yeah. So, I mean, you can probably pull up all the, uh, you know, all the different off flavors and everything, right? Yeah. You, uh, you, you know, you, uh, you, you, you know, if you want, you grab a QC sheet for every, uh, every yeast you use, put it in a binder, uh, take a screenshot of it. If that's easier. That's really cool. I had no idea. Um, and we're making that, we're tying that in, in a little bit. I talked about the innovations in Pure Pitch coming out later. We've got some cool things in, in the QC part too. And uh, uh, that's going to be part of that. A little bit easier to find and, you know, to get your, to get your, rather than going in and typing it in and stuff like that. And then I want to ask you about your favorite subject, which is scheduling. <laughs> How do you schedule all these things? <laughs> Well, uh, we have to pay people to do it, right? Uh, we have staff that do that. <laughs> Those production planners. Uh, 
So we, we went to that suite in 2016, and it caused us some problems for a while because it's a hard system to work with. And we uh, were missing a lot of orders that year and then, you know, made a few people mad, which I never like to do. But we've really got it down now. Um, and, you know, that's, it's owned by Oracle, and you, you see them advertising sometimes on, on TV. Um, but it's a really powerful system. Um, and it's good because it's expensive. But it's good. It's powerful. So uh, all the orders are in there. Uh, all of uh, just about everything is in there. Right. So the production planners are looking at what's on order and, and kind of globally. Right. Because they're trying to plan Copenhagen's production again, Asheville, San Diego and where all these orders are coming in from. Um, and when somebody orders from us, we give them a date when they get it. That's what a lot of people want. Uh, retail stores are a little different. We make a certain batches per week, and then they know how much. They can also see exactly what's there when they're ordering. But for the commercial brewery, if they want, you know, four liters of California ale yeast next Thursday, we got to deliver it to them next Thursday, right? So of we got to ship yeah. it Wednesday overnight. It's got to be ready that Wednesday. It's got to have all the QC done. It's got to have everything done. And so that's all part of that planning. And then, of course, you got to back up. You got to back up. You got to back up the production, and then all the way to the lab, right? Oh yeah, for, for a lot of these all the batches. Way to the yeah. You know, if it's a private strain, we won't have a freeze plate because maybe we make it once a year or twice a year or something for a commercial brewery or distillery or something. So that's going to have a different timeline, all built into Netsuite. But the planners are looking at all of these strains, you know, all the <laughs> spreadsheets. That's and. Uh, and I mean, I could ask them for anything. I could ask them for anything about any strain coming up or past, and they'll give me a spreadsheet for it. That's They're really awesome. cool. Uh, and it's really made us uh, be able to scale up to the point we are uh, because everything used to, used to be chaos. Uh, you know, I mean, um, the, the, the Excel sheets, and the, all, we don't have any of that stuff anymore. Uh, it's all in that suite. Uh, and, um, it allows us to fulfill our orders. I mean, even a couple of years ago, we were still having a hard time with home brew stores under, under shipping things like they'd order a hundred or something. We ship them 50. Well, that's all we had. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, we don't really do that anymore because we know exactly how much we're making. That's awesome. And planning for. So those have been huge achievements. Well, Chris, we're getting near the end, but I wanted to ask one more question. Um, you mentioned you got some future plans. You got some future uh, improvements to Pure Pitch and so on coming out. Can you talk a little bit about those? Yeah, uh, it, it's it's listening to what home brewers want, what commercial breweries want, um, some other industries want, and you know, again, what our own staff wants. So we uh, we're we were going to release. Uh, this all at Craft Brewers Conference, you know, April in in uh, San Antonio, Texas. I, I, I don't think that's but happening this time, right? That's not happening. <laughs> I'm pretty sure everything's just going to be 2021. Uh, I don't think we're going to have a lot of conferences this year. But even on our reduced schedules, we're we're still working on um, all of those, plus some other innovations. We've created all these great teams at the end of last year to work on a lot of, excuse me, innovation projects. So we're spending some of our time right now doing that. But, of course, a lot of the prototypes and other things we need are also closed factories uh, or, sh or partially shut down factories. So everything's kind of slower right now. Yeah. Um, and if somebody's working a four-hour shift or an eight-hour shift or six-hour shift instead of a whatever, you know, um, their, their time's also a little smaller. But we're moving these things along, and we still uh, want to come out with these innovations um, later so this talk, year. Talk about, can you talk a little bit about some of them, or, or are they all top secret still? Well, we, we just came out with a new nutrient that was designed for, uh, mostly designed for hard cider, but you really need a lot of, uh, a lot of nitrogen for hard cider. Right. Um, we're working on a new website. We're, you know, uh, we're, we just released uh, some uh, online training classes, and we're also now offering some free, those are for, for cost, but we have some free webinars going on every Wednesday. So I'm doing one uh, um, next Wednesday um, at on uh, 25 years of homebrewing. I, and I, each week we're just going to do. I think that's webinar. a great. Yeah, I think that's a great thing. In fact, I'm looking at trying to find a webinar service, maybe offer some of that too, while everybody's locked down. You know, I think it's a good. Yeah, thing. Uh, the platforms are great. Uh, you know, there's jokes. Uh, you know, Zoom's in the news a lot because 
of people using Zoom for their meetings. And there's some pretty funny uh, sketches on that because it does sound a little crazy. But we've been using Zoom for years. Uh, we've been doing uh, by doing the off uh, uh, the multiple facilities and some offsite workers. We've been communicating like this for a while. Our our phones make no difference if they're in the office or you know the phones people are calling for orders or at somebody's house. So we've kind of at least by accident are able to still work together and and do these things uh, even during this time right now. And then Zoom also has a great uh, kind of webinar feature um, that. Uh, I don't know if maybe a little pricey or not compared to other platforms, but uh, uh, cause they work in increments of a hundred, you know? Um, yeah. But, but we had a big, uh, we did a webinar this Wednesday with Joe Karowski, our head of brewing technology and um, kind of runs all that hot side of everything here, including the beers. And it was great. We had a couple hundred people join. Nice. That's awesome. Well, Chris, I really appreciate you stepping up, especially, I had, like I said, I had a couple cancellations this month and thrown in a little bit of chaos, but I'm trying to keep the podcast going and uh, certainly my intent to keep it going. And I appreciate you uh, stepping in at the last minute here. Well, good luck keeping it going. I can see the sun's coming down on my screen here. I see uh, that. Yeah, it's a little <laughs> bit of splash there on the yeah. video. Uh, but thanks for doing it. Uh, I'm happy to do it. You know, these are uh, tough times for everybody uh, since it's impacting everybody's bottom line uh you know uh you know if you're not working and so but we will get through it and we will the country's going to learn a lot absolutely and uh we are all in it together everybody in the world is uh f f you know f f going through exactly the same things you and i are going through right now so yeah. um anyways thanks for being there chris really appreciate you coming on the show thanks again thanks brad i look forward to the next one so again, my guest today was uh, Dr. Chris White, president and founder of White Labs, one of the largest commercial beer yeast providers in the world. Chris, uh, always a pleasure. Thank you. Well, a big thank you to Chris White for joining me this week. Thanks also to Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. They're currently offering 20% off their all-access subscription pass with access to videos, brewing courses, exclusive articles, and the amazing Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Go to beerandbrewing.com slash beersmith to get your all-access pass today. Again, that's beerandbrewing.com slash beersmith. And also the Brew Easy. Brew big and small spaces with the best all-grain ultra-compact system available. The Brew Easy's revolutionary setup combines bass barge efficiency, brew-in-a-bag simplicity, and the work clarification of a rim system. It's easy to set up, easy to operate, and easy on the eyes. Electric and propane models are available. It's also the system that I personally brew on. Visit BlickmanEngineering.com for more information. Again, that's BlickmanEngineering.com. And Beersmith 3 is available for both desktop and mobile platforms. Beersmith 3 adds mead, wine, and cider support, new whirlpool hop options, support for high-altitude beer brewing, and a whole lot more. Check out Beersmith 3 and get your free 21-day trial today from Beersmith.com. Thank you for listening. I hope you have a great brewing week. Thank you.